Thank you. I'm delighted to be with you and excited to share what I've been learning about, about the power of questions the last few years. So we all know that the world is complex and it's full of change. And I will propose that the power of asking the right questions is the anchor in the storm. That's my proposition. Let's see if you believe it. Here we go. Forty years ago, I started the love affair with photography. And since then, I wander around the world with a single question, what's interesting? I'm always watching for what's interesting. I was in northern Paris in the antiques market area, and I noticed this plastic car up on a wall. I thought, that's interesting, and started to take some photos of it. But if I had been living in 1886, I would never have been able to do that, even if I had the question, because I would not have been a professional photographer. And in 1886, you had cameras that were uh, about a half meter by a half meter wide. You had to be a professional to use them. And if you and I went to have our pictures taken, we would have gone to a shop where they would have had this big camera. It would have taken a long time. It would have been expensive. And finally, we would have received our picture back. But you and I would not have been taking those pictures. George Eastman lived at this point in time, 1886. He worked in the industry in the technology side, and he actually bought that camera equipment when he was a young father. And he bought it to go on vacation with his family. Can you imagine that? This stuff, 1886, taking that on vacation. And three days before they were, three days before they were supposed to leave, <laughs> the family actually got sick, and they couldn't go. So he's sitting there reflecting to himself, a family like me, how could we do this differently? I don't want to be carrying all this equipment around. He then used his design thinking and all his questions in the world to figure out a better way to make a camera. Fast forward four years to 1900, it's the brownie box camera. It cost one US dollar. It transformed the complex, expensive process for very few people into a simple, inexpensive process for not only millions, but today billions of people who use cameras to take picture. You put a roll of film inside, you've got this invention, it's a cardboard box. That's a disruptive innovation. These are what they do. Complex, expensive process for few to an inexpensive, simple process for many people. Fast forward, 1947, my mother, after World War II, is traveling through Europe. She's in, this, in Paris on the stairs of the San Madeleine Church. She has her picture taken with a Kodak camera. But it's a Kodak number three. It's an innovation that is sustaining. It keeps the product line going. Now we fast forward, 1963. Fujifilm enters the US, Kodak's home market. They come in with film that is cheaper than Kodak's. What does Kodak have to do? They have to get way more efficient. And they focus on efficiency to be able to compete with Fujifilm in their own market. Now, the challenge becomes, as a company or as an individual, the moment we focus and completely put our energy on efficiency as an innovation, we are setting ourselves up to be disrupted. That's what happened to Kodak. So fast forward, 1975. In Kodak Labs, they developed the first electronic camera. But for a lot of reasons, do nothing with it. Fast forward, 19, no, 2006, I join INSEAD. I move to Paris. I go to the same steps where my mother had her picture taken. It actually was taken with the Kodak electronic camera. Fast forward now, 2012, my daughter, the granddaughter of my mother, is now working in Paris. She has her picture taken on the same stairs. What kind of camera? An iPhone. The disruptor in 1900 becomes the disrupted in 2012. And I would suggest that the story of Kodak is the story of life. It's the story of individual leaders. It's the story of strategic teams. It's the story of any company or country. Either we are waking up and disrupting the world, or we are being disrupted. There is no middle ground. And so what I'm going to suggest is, how can we be the disruptors? And what we did working with Clayton Christensen to develop this book called The Innovator's DNA is we went out into the world and said, OK, who are the greatest disruptors out there? The people who have changed the world with the questions they asked and the answers they got. We interviewed 100 plus of these people. Jeff Bezos at Amazon, Nicholas Zenstrom at Skype, 
Pierre Omanyar from eBay, Peter Thiel from uh, PayPal, and on and on. Um, Fadi Gondor down in the Middle East, he founded this company called Aramix. Anyway, the issue is, how did they get their initial ideas that led to these companies that changed their industry? Now pretend that you shadowed them for a day or a week or a month even. You would see them doing things that non-disruptors don't do. And here's what they do. Number one, they think differently. Steve Jobs, you know the story. He worked in two industries, the, the computer industry and then running Pixar in the entertainment industry. We know from our data that working in two industries doubles the probability that someone will get a disruptive idea that actually creates value. How many of you have worked in two or more industries? You've just upped your chances for being a disruptor. It's the same story for living or working in two different countries. It's getting different viewpoints that gives us the capacity to see the world differently. Now, they think differently because they act differently. Literally, they act differently. And one of the things they do is they ask a lot of questions. And they're provocative questions. They're ones that cause people to be uncomfortable. They question everything. So you've got Albert Einstein who said this years ago. You've got Jack Dorsey who lives by it, founder of Twitter and, and, and other, other companies. But that's the notion, question everything. And this is the challenge. That guy is jumping into a swimming pool, right? The water's deep. What's the worst of all worlds for him? The worst of all worlds is that he doesn't know how to swim, and he doesn't know it, <laughs> right? Because if he knew he didn't know how to swim, he would not be jumping off the diving board. This is the disruptive challenge. It's figuring out what questions we don't know we don't know and start asking them. And if we don't figure it out, I promise you someone else will find those questions and we'll be going off the diving board into the other side. This guy's name is Stuart Brand. Here's his strategy for uncovering what he doesn't know he doesn't know. He found that a, a book called the, last, the Whole Earth Catalog lasted for years, the last issue, the last page was Stay Hungry, Stay Foolish. Steve Jobs used that phrase in his Stanford commencement address about his life and his life story, Stay Hungry, Stay Foolish. I, I talked with Stuart Brand about how do you find the right questions, Stuart? Single line answer. Every day I wake up wondering how many things I am dead wrong about. Does anyone do that in this room? Hasso raised his hand. <laughs> You're one of those Stuart fans in the world. Which is, it's, it's not that we're trying to destroy everything, it's just that every day we're wondering what am I dead wrong about with this employee I'm interacting with? Or with the service we're delivering to somebody? What am I not quite seeing here? So how these people go out with the right questions is they essentially, they're constantly trying to figure out what's working, what's not, and why. And so this guy's name's A.G. Lafley. He was the CEO of Procter & Gamble and chairman, 2001, 2009, recently returned. I interviewed A.G. before he ever became the CEO. He asked me more questions than I asked him in the research project. And he does this when he wanders the world. And he's got a dominant question that drives his leadership at Procter & Gamble. He goes into a new country. He lands, leaves the airport. Where's the first place he goes? Might check into a hotel. Where's the first place he goes afterwards? He goes to supermarkets. It's a consumer products company. And when he's in that store, what questions are he, is he asking? Because the questions he asks drives the data he sees. If he's interested in what products are placed, that's what he'll see. What other products are there? What's the price point? Where is it? All those kinds of questions. His question is actually, are consumers delighted when they buy our products? Is there any sparkle in their eyes, any excitement when they buy our products? Now, has anyone ever seen someone excited buying laundry detergent? <laughs> but that's what he's looking for, any excitement here. After he visits a few stores, then he goes into homes. And what question is driving his observations, his conversations in those homes? 
Are consumers delighted when they use our products? And after he does six or seven homes, then he goes to the country or regional headquarters and has a very intriguing conversation with real-time personal data about delight or non-delight of those consumers in that country. It's a very interesting process. I also happen to be an advisory board member at a privately held company in Canada. It's a pharmaceutical company called PharmaScience. I'll never forget the first board meeting where it's a traditional board meeting. The business units brought their strategic plans to the board. They delivered their ideas. We had some conversation. But it was almost staged. And we decided, we're going to change this. And so we said, next board meeting, here's the process. Each business unit leader, your job is to decide what are the one or two questions you are most wrestling with running your business. The tough stuff you don't have the answers to. And guess what? We want you to tell us those questions as board members before we even get to that meeting. 